you know, Stripe is one of these interesting companies because I think most people want to pretend they know what you do, and most people don't know what you do. Um, the lights are pretty far out. How many people think they know what Stripe does? A couple hands. Uh, how many people, if somebody afterwards had asked you, what does Stripe do, you'd raise your hand because you're supposed to know what Stripe does. OK, well, at least we can solve that. Yeah, so totally. um, you guys started, obviously, payments processing is a big part. But that's not really the only thing you guys do right now, right? Yeah, so, um, so actually, more than 50% of folks in the US have bought something through Stripe. Uh, so you guys may not all know about us, but you've probably used us. And it really is about replacing the old world of having an acquiring account having to deal with the compliance and all the reporting and going international with your payments and billing and payments infrastructure. And instead, you can start a business and be up and running accepting payments with Stripe uh, if you're a great developer in a few hours. And you can do it in you know, over 25 countries all around the world. Um, we accept all the cur currencies. Though recently not Bitcoin. And we're well, definitely we going to touch. About, this is uh, a very big crypto. But, if you were at yesterday's Investor Day, it was like crypto, crypto, crypto. So these guys just stopped taking Bitcoin. So we are going to get to that. But Stripe is really more than about payments and the acceptance and sort of putting that through an API, similar to sort of AWS in the cloud. It's really about the software that helps you run and build your business. And so I think uh, what you might be referring to is we've built a lot of products on top of that platform. Some of them are like Atlas, which is about Anywhere in the world you can spend 500 bucks and incorporate your company, get tax advice, get a bank account in the US, get a Stripe account. Um, and that's about reducing the barriers to entrepreneurs who are in places in the world that just don't have the benefits of being a business in the United States. Or closer to home, there's a lot of work we do with marketplace companies. So we, we power DoorDash, Lyft, Postmates, we work with Kickstarter, and the intricacies of being able to accept pay in and pay out across the, the drivers or the Kickstarter um, projects is, is actually involves pretty complicated software. And we build that software so the companies don't have to, so they can focus on growing their business. And you guys started doing taxes, too, for people? Yeah, part of Atlas is, is tax assistance and increasingly now filing forms for when you're incorporating your company and then handling the taxes and the um, really important founding documents on ownership. And does that extend, I mean, a, there's a pathway to where you just do more and more of that. Is, is there areas where you're like, yeah, we know we don't want to be X? Like, or is it just, we'll see where all this goes? I think that any good company has a broad enough mission, and ours is to increase the GDP of the internet. Uh, for me, I think a lot about economic access, which payments is one of the last unsolved problems, in my view, of the internet. And it's because it's, frankly, really old. Currency and cash has been around for a long time. And it's about geographic borders, when the internet is no longer about geographic borders. And there aren't protocols built for, for how you move currency and money. And that goes to crypto as well. And, and so what we're about is solving that fundamental access and infrastructure issue. And I think it extends into a lot of directions. Uh, we haven't ruled anything out. But of course, we're focused right now on scaling a lot of our core business, as one is at our age as a company. And on that core business, I mean, one of the things that you guys get most of your business from is processing the actual payments behind the scenes for a lot of big things. Uh, there was a deal that apparently yesterday, a big one in the thing that came up for bid, you know, uh, I was surprised to hear Adyen taking over for eBay, not, not maybe you guys or someone else. Is that a deal you guys would have liked to have had? Is it like Costco where, you know, it just the economics don't make sense or? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, look, the PayPal eBay thing, of course, we're watching because them separating as a company, and then I think this is more of a step by eBay to say we're going to move beyond working with PayPal. And yeah, they're starting with Adyen, which obviously has a, a lot of international uh, footprint. Uh, but I imagine it's going to be a long process to see how that actually plays out. Right? They're not done with the PayPal relationship until 2020. Uh, and my expectation is they have to rebuild a lot internally. Uh, and I wish. So do you I think there's? Not still room for you guys in there, or you think that, that was like I the deal? I imagine there is. I imagine there is. Um, I think it's, to me, it was more of a statement that eBay was making about being independent than anything else. OK, so yesterday there was a ton of talk about blockchains. And you know, I think in this crowd, you have a lot of people that are, are really interested in this. You guys recently took the step. You had been accepting it. You're not going to process it. Why, why is that 
first of all. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm proud of us. We were the first company to integrate accepting Bitcoin. And what happened over time is it became more a store of value than a currency or a transaction unit. And how that showed up is, one, our users weren't integrating it. They weren't using it. We weren't seeing high rates of it. And I think it's because the settlement times were inconsistent. The fees were rising. The pricing would change. So you'd purchase something, and then we're settling a different amount. Um, so it just didn't show up anymore as a currency. But we're optimistic. I mean, I think there's going to be more. And, and I, ho I hope to see which they are. So is the decision, like, we're done with Bitcoin, or is it we're done with crypto, or is it it's not making sense right now, and you might revisit that at some point. I think we're not done. I think that Bitcoin, in this exact specific example, is more of a store of value right now. And so it doesn't make sense for us to take it as a payment unit. But if you look at Litecoin, Lightning, Ethereum, Stripe made a seed investment in Stellar, um, I'm, I have a lot of optimism uh, that there will be future transaction units that are crypto. And that'll be exciting. It'll be exciting for reinventing what I was just talking about, which is how we move money. And is there anything you guys are doing today that's other than investing in a company like Seller? Are there other things you guys are doing to kind of build that out and to make it more of what you do? Or you think it has to kind of be there before you can? Well, if you think about what we're doing at a meta level, which is really not just about payment processing, it is about the software infrastructure that hasn't yet really existed. What a lot of we do is integrate with existing financial institutions who don't have the technology to advance to the next phase that I think we're going to see. Um, in, in the revolution of like how do businesses build and how do they accept currencies uh, and settle them in other currencies around the world. It sounds like it should be obviously fixed by now, but it's not. So if you think of us as building the software layer and the ability to accommodate any type of payment method, we're going to be there for those types of payment methods. But you're right, they have to be ready. They have to be in use. Um, and so it's really just about staying current with what our users want. And was there a peak? Was there a time where Bitcoin usage was enough to justify it? Or you did it anticipating it, and it just never really materialized? It didn't become a very meaningful part of our volume. Okay. Um, one of the things that you also bring in, you're the COO at Stripe, is sort of a sense of how do you take a company as it's growing, and there's and entrepreneurs in the room. What are some of the things that you guys feel like, that you feel, yeah, we've done this right. And what are some of the things that you feel like are, are really hard problems that companies need to spend more time thinking than maybe you did or others have done? Yeah. Um, so I was at Google for 10 and a half years through a lot of the scaling of Google. And a lot of joining Stripe was like, this is a chance for me to have an impact in building um, really thoughtfully. Uh, but it's hard, because you're basically on a speeding train going 100 miles an hour and adding a lot of people because your business is growing. We have you know, hundreds of thousands of users. We uh, are a global company now. Um, but the thing that, that I think most companies sort of miss is when they go from that first stage, which is product market fit. Do you have traction? Do you have users? Are they paying for your product or service? And they miss when they, they hit the growth phase. And you actually have to shift quite meaningfully when you hit that phase. And, and the most meaningful shift is about, um, this is a, a favorite analogy of mine, but you've got a group of people. They have a common goal. Uh, but there's a little bit of an effect of, I'm now going to take a bunch of people, picture a playing field. I, I'm going to give them a bunch of different sporting implements. And I'm going to stick them on the playing field and tell them to win. And they don't have structures. They don't have uh, enough of a knowledge of what winning looks like, what a decision on the field is, what kind of the guidelines and rules are for the game. And if you do that for too long with a company, with any organization, people get hurt. You know, the hockey sticks hitting the person with the cricket bat, right? And so when I think about what we've done, it's pause and stop and think, OK, we're going to be flat in terms of our state of mind, but adding experienced management and leadership uh, drafting what I call founding documents. It's one thing when everyone's in the room and the founders are there and you're making decisions together. You have to scale your decision making or you're going to get bottlenecked on a couple of people. Um, and so I love the medical school analogy, you know, see one, do one, teach one. A lot of it is bringing in leaders, helping them understand what we call our operating principles, documenting what those are, and keeping the company on an even core of this is what we're about, this is how we do things, now go and run and build. But if you go and build without the structures, you are going to get end up in chaos. And you're talking about the process of it, but the other thing we're hearing a ton about lately is the values piece. Yeah. And you know, having been at Google, you know, now at Stripe, where do you see that play in, and what what needs to be established early on from a values perspective, and where where do the dangers come in around sort of 
the mission being one thing and the values sort of being a nice to have versus. So, so that was a lot of what we did was not just talk about the mission, but talk about our values or what we call our operating principles. And they came from the DNA that was in the company. And so I was fortunate enough to be at one time recruited for a bunch of high growth startups as I was leaving Google. And it's, the startups don't realize it, but if you come in and you've been someone who's operated in, in the world for a while, you feel the culture. You feel the values, walking down the hall, meeting with the founders, talking to people on the teams. And that DNA is in there early. And what you have to do is think about what are we really about and how do we make sure we're consistent with that as we grow? And I think something about Stripe that, you know, it's founded by two Irish immigrants. Um, they have an incredibly global perspective. They're curious, collaborative, interested in building infrastructure with a long-term play on economic opportunity. And the company has always been, you know, some of our values are about thinking rigorously, uh, trust and amplify, which is how do we work together but question each other, but do it in a constructive way. Um, and I think that we also have one which is, you know, does this pass the front page test? And we would, you know, we have to be a company, we want to be a company of high integrity. You got to say that so that when something gets out of alignment, you can go and talk to a person and say, you know what, this isn't the, way, the kind of company we want to be. But John and Patrick led with that. Like young companies are just a mirror on their founders. So what were some of the other um, types of experiences, types of cultures you saw when you were considering different things? Um, yeah, you, you decided to go to Stripe, you didn't end up somewhere like Uber. Was there a moment where you might have gone that direction? Was, was there a culture fit that you were like, yeah, this company's interesting, but I don't want any part of that culture? Um, there are moments where the idea or what the company's doing is fantastic and really interesting, um, but ultimately I didn't decide to take some opportunities because of the culture. Uh, because you, especially if you're going to be the partner with the founder or the founders, if you don't have an alignment on your values, I'm a particular person who I'm out of there. Like, mm -hmm. So it w I maybe would not have lasted very long in some environments that didn't have a core set of values alongside building a really fantastic, exciting business. Uh, I think it's something people don't consider enough, actually, when they join companies, which is making sure, you know, kind of, you want to have an alignment of your value system and wherever you're working, especially if it's young and growing. Um, to be happy and be authentic. Uh, and so yes, there were some cultures that, that weren't appealing to me. And what do you make of sort of how, how much has Silicon Valley, has the tech industry grown up in the last year? We've spent a lot of time talking about values, a lot of time talking about harassment, a lot of time talking about diversity. Um, has much changed from your experience, or from your, from your sense, uh, drawing on your experience? Do you think enough has changed, has much changed, or have we just spent a year kind of recognizing we have a problem? Um, I feel like I'm, I, we're, I'm not far, we're not far enough away from it to really answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that people are talking about it. I have to be really honest with you and tell you, there's a lot of talking, and I'm more interested in action, and I'm more interested in getting like to work and demonstrating like for us, we have a serious amount of things to do, to do something that I feel is personally important, you know, for economic access in the world. I mean, I know I sound very cliched, but um, that's how you meaningfully change the game, is that people have opportunities that they would not have had. And I mean that for any, any person of any background. Um, and so we'll, I think time will tell. It's been an interesting time, but it does feel like a lot of talk. And one of the things that, that, that you guys have had to deal with as a company and a lot of um, civically minded companies have had to deal with is how much time do you spend being a public citizen, being a corporate citizen, speaking out on issues. And I, mm -hmm. I talked to uh, Patrick, I interviewed him not that long ago. And you know, there's sort of, and I've talked to other founders that, that um, have a real passion for a bunch of these issues and feel strongly yeah, yeah. about a lot of what they see going on in our country and are struggling with how much time do I spend speaking out against all these things that I may or may not agree with versus just running my business. How much is that a big conversation inside Stripe? How do you guys deal with uh, the balance between running the business but also Speaking out on issues, obviously, I know immigration is pretty big mm -hmm. for for you guys as a Absolutely. company. Absolutely, it is. Um, it's really hard. We have a lot to do, and we have not proven ourselves. We haven't won yet, right? And so, I, I think that we don't spend as much time. But I think we're at an interesting time in history where 
where is government and leadership coming from, and, and where are the voices that people are listening to. And you, I do feel that, that people who are entrepreneurs and leaders and who are building new business models have some responsibility to participate in the dialogue. And I think Patrick and John do as individuals, and I think that's also their right. Um, for Stripe, in terms of policy platforms or positions, we're starting to talk about it, but we're really mindful that, one, our product, I mean, I just talked about Atlas, which is, you know, we have entrepreneurs from over 260 countries who are now incorporated in doing business. Some of them would not have been able to, I think, or maybe with $10,000 and trips to the U.S., they would have been able to, but I'm hoping we reduced a barrier to entry there. Like, that's meaningful from, from a policy perspective, and if we can stay focused on that, I'm hoping in the long term we have a bigger impact. Now, have you guys thought about the reverse product? So Atlas, the way it works is if you are in, a, in another country and you want to incorporate in the US, yeah. um, you know, it helps you get bank accounts and the mm -hmm. things that you need to set up yeah, a Delaware services, or whatever. Exactly. Um, but, but maybe with you know, all the, the Never Trump crowd, maybe you could do the other where you know, people that are here now, so, some way that they can like go overseas and, and still be here. Is there any sort of reverse? Hey. I think Atlas. that the, the reverse Atlas. I think that the future uh, for us is actually multiple incorporation hubs. To answer, yeah, of course. If people want to incorporate in in the EU or in APAC somewhere, that is something that we would hope to do. What other things are kind of on your like? This is something we need to sort of do. This is an opportunity that we need to think more about. That are kind of greenfield areas for Stripe. That you're like. I don't know exactly what we're going to do in this area, but this is a real opportunity. I think the biggest, I mean, this is going to sound, we talk a lot internally about working on infrastructure and working on like hard long-term problems that aren't like maybe particularly sexy to describe. So this is not going to sound particularly sexy, but a lot of where we're putting our emphasis is if you're thinking of, you're an entrepreneur and you're building a business and we've eliminated a whole mass of work that you would have had to do to set up your billing and payments infrastructure, we're trying to add, as I explained, software that eliminates other masses of work that you had to do to set up that business model. So whether it's pay in and pay out on marketplaces or for subscription or SaaS businesses, the logic around subscriptions is no joke. Like you really um, have to build a pretty sophisticated system when your business is scaling. Why can't we give you an API so that you can tap into to our logic? Or we have a product called Radar, which is about fraud prevention, which is also one of the things that can take down a young business if you don't have sophisticated rules, and because we can train our engines on all of the fraud data and the machine learning we have across all of our transactions, you're going to benefit from everyone's data in an anonymized way if you use a product like Radar. And so we're doing what seem like basic building block things so entrepreneurs can focus on building their business, and that's what the future is. So you mentioned subscriptions. Micropayments is one of those things that I feel like we have talked about as an industry since like mm -hmm. dot com 1.0. It, it doesn't, it's always there, it's always on the horizon. Is that a problem that you or someone else is gonna solve in the next couple of years? Um, I think someone has to solve it because we have to solve, I mean, we were talking about this before, how can we access and pay for content? Right, and I think we all care that there are great sources of information and reliable sources of news, and the model is shifting, right? Ad-based models are shifting, and so I'm, I'm not gonna promise we're gonna solve it, but it is something we talk a lot about because it's meaningful that you can, now what does that look like? Can you bundle micropayments? Can you come up with um, really, really fast verification so that we know who someone is and then we can bundle in a different kind of a meta account, right? Like there's a lot of ideas there. But um, I would love to see us. Because I mean, we talked about like you know today, Wired just launched a paywall, and it's like it's really tough to go from totally free to this paywall. And that's kind of what I was saying about the subscriptions project yeah. product. Like, it's why don't people have more bundles or options? You know why? Because it's actually very hard to build and administer and close your books on. And that's what we're trying to solve. And if we solve it in that manner, it should be able to be applicable. So next year, Upfront Summit, your startup, you'll be able to get. Subscription manager. I think I'm going to get in trouble with someone if I promise <laughs> <laughs> by next year. But yeah, coming soon. All right. Well, thank you very much, Claire. Thanks, everybody. All right.